There we go. <clears throat> well, good morning. We are live here on Greenspan Network uh, Facebook Live, joining in a Earth Day celebration. Um, I'm Bonnie Baker. I am the Acting Executive Director for the Greenspan Network and Vice President of the Board. And I'm here with Megan Leffler. She's our Community Manager. And uh, Thomas Eddington and Marie Noel Kaiser. I hope I said that right, Marie Noel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maria is the um, co-founder and CEO of the We Forest organization, a global nonprofit organization dedicated to supplying corporations with science-based solutions for reforestation and re, um, re restoration of forests. And Tom is a, a dear member of our Greenspan Network family. He's the principal of Eddington Advisory and a consultant and educator and entrepreneur and strategic advisor for many organizations who wish to increase their own sustainability and effectiveness. Um, and we are talking today about a very important subject for our organization and for our members. Um, GSN is a nonprofit organization working within the spa industry. And we work to move the spa industry and the wellness industry towards a more, more sustainable footprint and sustainable activities. Underlying individual health and wellness, of course, is the access to natural resources and a healthy environment. And we all know that these are becoming more and more scarce. So GSN has taken a look recently um, into what actions we have available and what can be the greatest impact on replenishing the planet and sustaining planet. Um, we have found that that is probably the best solution is trees and planting trees and restoring forests. So we're talking today about what we are planning for our first annual action initiative. And this is a critical and urgent need to regenerate the earth with trees. Um, without, without spending more time going into that, because a lot of information will be coming for, forward in the next few weeks, I'd like to open up our conversation with Tom and Marie Noel and Megan um, about why trees are really the best technology for fighting climate change and for deterring global warming. And uh, with that, we're celebrating here Earth Day and Tom, I'll turn it over to you and, and uh, see what you have to say about trees as a technology. <laughs> well, thank you, Bonnie, <clears throat> and welcome everyone. Um, when I think about trees, um, I mean, historically, we, we uh, culturally have thought about trees as just a resource to either provide us with fruit and nuts or to be cut down to provide us with timber, um, to provide us with shade on a sunny day, and maybe a wind barrier if you're in a particularly windy part of the world. Um, but we've, we've lost our connection with trees as beings. And trees unselfishly provide us with uh, an amazing <clears throat> amount of things, not just food and shelter, but they sequester uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. And when we think about CO2, about half of it goes into the atmosphere, about a quarter goes into the oceans and gets sequestered there, and about a quarter gets sequestered on, on the land. And we've depleted over the last 150 years about half of the topsoil on the planet. And uh, topsoil is actually very good at sequestering uh, CO2, but trees are <clears throat> unselfishly absorbing CO2 and providing us with oxygen and the, the elements that we need to live on this planet. Tom, you mentioned topsoil. So oftentimes we think of trees as just, you know, the ability to, um, to filter CO2, but you had mentioned at one point in time to us that it takes a thousand years for a layer of topsoil to be created. Could you speak to that a little bit more? Sure. So when we when we think about topsoil, I mean, po most people, their relationship with topsoil is it's, it's just dirt. And the reality is that topsoil, if you pick up a handful of topsoil, there's more living bacteria and organisms in a handful of topsoil than there are people on the planet. And when we think about topsoil, it's an amazing um, microbiome of life. And it, it provides us with not only the nutrients we need for our food, but it, as I said, it, it sequesters CO2 from the atmosphere and it, it provides <clears throat> so much of the infrastructure, so to speak, for the planet. Yeah, absolutely. And we've also seen a lot of research recently about the, the, um, 
fungi networks and the mushroom networks that are actually, you know, subsoil communication networks between trees throughout, you know, different ecosystems and things. So it's really a fascinating. Yeah, it a really fascinating. is the, uh, it is the, uh, the internet of the earth. The internet of the earth, I like that. This is weird. <laughs> Tom, why are we looking at this as being so urgent? Um, we talk about this, you know, kind of tipping point that we're coming to and that there is literally a finite amount of time that we have before we, we might not be able to go reverse these effects. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that's a great question, Bonnie. Thank you. Um, so if, if we look over the last 66 million years, the amount of CO2 that was in the atmosphere was about 270 to 280 parts per million. And in the last century, um, that number increased to a point that we had been, you know, scientists had been telling us for a while that we couldn't exceed 350 parts per million. And if, if we hit that number, it would increase the, the temperature of the earth by one degree. And that was a critical number. Um, Bill McKibben and others have been talking about that for decades, about the urgency of not hitting 350. And we hit that number. It took us about 100 years to hit that number. And then the alarm bell started going off that, oh, my gosh, we, we could actually hit 450. And 450 would mean that Earth's, Earth's atmosphere, or the temperature of the Earth, would increase by, by two degrees, which was a, a tipping point and a point of no return. And we're on, currently on the trajectory of hitting 450 in a 30 year period. So if it took us 100 years to increase the Earth's atmosphere, to, to get to 350 and in increase the atmosphere by one degree, we're about to hit that number in 30 years. And so by 2030, if we don't do some, some activities urgently, then we're, we're likely to hit the 450. And once we've increased the Earth's atmosphere by two degrees, then we're in trouble. And when we think about climate change, there, there are three dimensions that I think about. The first is what, what people talk about in, in, in the context of sustainability. So people are talking about how do we have more sustainable practices so we're emitting less CO2 into the atmosphere. And that's important and that's critical. And then there are some companies and there are some, some countries around the world that are looking at adaptation. So if we do exceed um, 450, or if we stay on the current trajectory and the climate continues to change and we have these wild climate swings, how do we adapt? How do we put in emergency measures? How do we change the construction? How do we do things differently to adapt to a, climbing, a changing climate? And then the third piece that people aren't talking about as much and why we're on the, on the live cast today is about how do we sequester the CO2 out of the atmosphere? And how do we take that step? And we're starting to hear people in the last four or five years talking about instead of sustainability, let's, let's talk about um, shifting from sustainability to regenerative. And that language is just starting to become uh, more commonly used. And I'm, I'm hopeful that folks will continue to do the sustainability practices they need, reduce their carbon footprint, adapt some of their you know, practices to be able to, to deal with climate change, but add this third component of how do we sequester the CO2 out of the atmosphere and how do we, how do we start regenerating um, the earth and um, make it possible that future generations can live on this planet. Fantastic, Tom. <clears throat> what, one of the things that I really like about what you said is the hopefulness because it can seem so... <laughs> So kind of heavy and uh, you know desperate, but um, one of the things that we keep trying to come back to is the positive pieces of this and the positive aspects of how we can still make a difference, how we can, you know, look towards a more positive future and impact. And so having hope rather than acting out of a place of fear or despair. Um, I know you sit on the board of We Forest, and that's how we've, we've come to the organization. I think that there's a lot of important points about how We Forest and many other tree planting initiatives have come to really, you know, take this on and face 
um, the, the magnitude of the task, but also the practical solutions that we can all come to. Marina, well, I wanna bring you into the conversation a little bit and talk about WeForest as an organization. What are some of the main characteristics um, that the organization has in being able to, um, to combat this you know, climate change and being effective in tree planting around the world? Um, could you share with us a little bit about your organization? Yes, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to share about our cause and uh, try to rally everyone and uh, explain some of the aspects. Actually, let me just go back for a second about the genesis of We Forest, the origins. Uh, Bill Liao and myself, we are uh, very interested in science and we worked with scientists and understood actually what Tom was explaining about the urgency to act. And actually, uh, Tom was uh, very optimistic and positive, but I would say it's a little harsher, is even if we stopped emitting today, like we stopped all carbon emissions today, we'd still face a difficult situation because the carbon is already there, has been released in the past decades and is stored in the oceans. And it takes 20 to 30 years to get out of the oceans and then it goes into the atmospheres and raises that PPM, that part per million that Tom was talking about. So when companies and people talk about, I'm gonna be reducing, well, that's nice, but that's not gonna do it. And what Tom said is very crucial. We need to remove what's in the atmosphere. We need to take it out. There's too much and take it out. And the only, and that's why we say it's a technology, a tree is a technology. The only technology that can really do that, even though some people are trying to do it with carbon capture and storage, which is very intensive and energy intensive process. Well, actually the only real simple tool to do that is a tree. Because remember, and that's a takeaway for today, that half of the biomass of a tree is pure carbon. And as long as it's there standing in the forest or even transformed into a piece of furniture and kept there is stored carbon. So it doesn't mean you can't touch the trees. You can even harvest some of the trees and keep them as wooden houses, furniture, or anything, as long as you don't burn them, right? So that's really important. So anyway, Bill and I, we realized all of that and we wanted to act, I guess, just like most of you, we have children and we wanted to leave something behind. And it, uh, it was very obvious that we had to work on global warming. And so we started We Forest in 2009. And what makes us special to answer your uh, question, Bonnie, or what makes us different maybe from other organizations is that we are science-based. Most of the team members are scientists, including myself, and all the work that we do, we develop projects are based on science. We work with international organizations, with FAO and other UN organizations to validate and verify what we do. And even we go further, we are working with others to develop a standard so that there is, there is a standard, there is a reference of what does it mean to restore a forest and when do we know it's good? So that's what we're working on. It's a long shot, obviously, but it's very encouraging because there's a need for that. And the other thing that, would, that you should remember about We Forest is that we have developed the expertise to engage corporates. Obviously, we like every citizen to participate and to act, but look at it, the, the corporates, they have millions of customers. They have thousands of employees. Look at the leverage they have and how by just deciding to step in and do something for climate, they can multiply that and really make it happen because we can't take a few centuries to get there. Tom was talking about one or 2% temperature increase. That's the average. But look at the North Pole, for example, where the ice is melting and the impact on the sea level rise. So it is not just one, percent, one degree, it's, it's much more. So it's, it's very important that we get big players and small players, but everybody engage to act now. There is no time to waste. That's really great. And Marie Noel, we're excited to be a part of it. And as part of our initiative at GSN, we've chosen to help reforest in India. And we were wondering why We Forest has chosen to focus planting on India. And can you tell us a little bit more about that community project as well that you guys have going on there? Yeah. 
Very good. Well, in most of the countries where we work, we plant the trees because the area uh, lacks water. Like we work in Ethiopia and other places where there's no water and we're trying to bring water back. Actually, in, the, in India, in the North Kasi Hills and the East Kasi Hills, uh, in the far uh, east of the country, a very remote area, it's the wettest place on earth. So you would be wondering why has we forest started a project over there? Well, it's not to increase the, the water availability, but actually it's the other way around. There's so much water. If there is nothing to retain soils and it's a very hilly area, a mountainous area, if there, there is nothing to keep uh, topsoil in place, then it's gonna be totally devastated. So it's actually to, to channel the water. And one of the main reason we went there is we were very moved by the women's initiative to uh, get engaged. It's a, actually, it's an indigenous community over there, not like the rest of India. And these women have uh, already before we came had uh, an initiative to start to restore their forests because they realized that they were losing them, that they were very degraded and that their future was depending on it. So they decided to start some self-help groups, as we call them, and we are working to empower them and give them uh, the training and the support they need. So they don't get money from us, for example, but they get training and they get pigs and get poultry so that they can earn a living while restoring the forest. So basically, that's uh, one of the aspects that we really liked in that project especially also because it's remote and they don't get much attention. So we want to give uh, those areas an opportunity. That's fantastic. Um, one of the, the things that Greenspan Network focuses on, and in fact, our tagline is vital people, vital planet. So the interaction that these reforestation projects have with the local communities and you know, specifically with India, and as you mentioned, um, this is a, a, an important piece of sustainability work anywhere around the world. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about that in, in the areas that you work, actually how many areas in the world does WeForest um, actively work right now? And what are some of those community aspects? I know we've spoken about the fact that forests actually create jobs and um, they have a particular effect on women in communities. So I'd like to ask either Marie Noel or Tom to, to speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, well, we, we work, as we mentioned, India, we work in Brazil, we work in Ethiopia and in Zambia. Those are the main projects. We have smaller projects in Tanzania and other places, but the main ones I mentioned. And actually, to be fair, it's quite easy to plant a tree. Anybody can go out there and plant a tree, right? Well, the question you've got to ask yourself is, is a tree going to survive? Because if it doesn't, then you're probably wasting your time. You may be having fun planting a tree, but it's not going to make any difference. So you'll make sure the tree survives in the long term. And ask yourself, why all of a sudden the people who in the past have been cut cutting trees for whatever reasons, because they needed it for firewood, they needed it for, for anything, uh, why would they stop doing that? Well, the question is, if they see more value in a standing tree than in a felled tree, then we win. So how do you create value for these people? You've got to uh, create jobs uh, with the standing trees. Like, for example, if they can harvest fruit and sell it, right? Or that as a reward for care planting and caring for the trees, they get beehives. And that creates short-term income, which in countries like Ethiopia or Zambia is very important. People aren't planning 20 years ahead and say, when... You know, when I'm older, I get uh, whatever. They want food now. They want to send their children to school now. So the, the real thing is the, the, the difficulty, the, the hard part of our work is not the planting trees. It's really getting uh, with the communities activities in place that are long term, that are solid and that bring value and that people adhere to and, and get enthusiastic about. That's actually the work of planting trees, which is a paradox, isn't it? It's not really about planting the trees. <laughs> Tom, I don't know if you wanted to add something. 
Um, I, I would just add that what you know one of the reasons why I've been such a huge supporter of Marie Noel and the work that WeForest is doing is exactly what she just described that, that they've taken a systemic approach. It's not just about planting trees. It's about getting out of this false choice of the economy or the environment. It's about changing the relationship that people in communities have with trees. It addresses some of the, their approach addresses some of the social dimension and, and aspects as well. We know that this century is the Sephora century. It's the this, it's this century of the, of the feminine. And it's not lost on me that three of you on this broadcast are, are women. And it's not lost on me that what We Forest is doing is creating economic opportunities for women so that they can support their communities, they can support their children, they can support a healthy environment. And that's a, that's a big piece of, for me personally, why I've been such a huge supporter of We Forest and the work they're doing. It's the, it's the community aspect, it's the relationship that people have with trees, uh, getting back to the comment I made earlier about changing the way we see trees is not just a resource, but they truly are beings. Yeah, fantastic and so inspiring, absolutely inspiring. Um, we're doing a lot of work in the wellness world right now with women in wellness. There's a lot of different initiatives and things. So I always am struck by how just naturally um, the, the work that is sustainability and the restoration on, on the planet, the mother earth really is a, a movement in the feminine. So um, not in feministic <laughs> activities, but definitely in awakening the feminine. So um, I, I think that one of the things that we were looking to, and while we're excited also with, with Green Spa Network and, and in our membership and in the spa members that we have and in the entire you know, expanding spa and wellness industry is that you know, as we look to creating more opportunities for human health and vitality, um, it's so directly intertwined with our, our environments, our communities, and in how um, our, our own, you know, smaller economies are, uh, are, are based on the different uh, sustainability approaches. But one of the things that you were explaining to me at, at one point, Tom, was kind of on a macro level, that there is a difficulty between the supply and demand chains, so that there's you know, there seems to be an oftentimes an abundance of, of, of funding available, but not oftentimes channels through which to be able to, um, to, to uh, deliver that funding. And I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit more to us, because our initiative and, and working with Green Forest is going to, and we'll talk about this later, but it will be um, encouraged on many levels. So whether it's at a small community level that we're, we're supporting community efforts, or whether it's through a large corporate spa division or through a you know, larger approach. We want to be able to address this on many different aspects, but um, if you could speak to that a little bit, it would be great. Yeah, I, I think it, it goes back to something Marie Noel mentioned earlier. Um, you know, in, in the 1980s and the 1990s, we saw people with good intentions going out and planting millions of trees, but they were doing it in a monocrop sort of way. They were planting the same tree just like somebody would be planting a soybean field or a, a corn field and thinking that they were, you know, they were doing good. And yeah, it, it was sequestering some CO2, but it wasn't creating the ecosystem. And what Marie Noel was just describing about the, you know, undertaking this, it's a, it's a complex um, solution. Of looking at the community, how do you get the community involved? How do you, um, how do you plant the right trees? How do you create the, and recreate or restore the ecosystem that existed before? And so it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to undertake. And we know that there are, around the equator is the best place to be planting trees. We need to be doing a, a polycrop approach to it. We need to try and replicate what nature provided us a template for. We need to do it in a way that community, so, all of that complexity makes it hard to find the projects. It makes it hard to figure out where the trees should be planted and how many. And, and because there are so many people, projects and organizations, it's, it's I, I would say it's a distributed model in terms of planting. 
but there there is a significant amount of funding that is available and it's it's a mismatch uh, economically in terms of large or large amounts of money but the projects may not be able to handle the the amount of money and marina well can talk to it much better than i can but that's that's what i've observed Yeah, that's one of the interesting things of why we've, you know, and how we've modeled this program and working with, uh, with We Forest in order to make sure that the that the channel is um, able to make the greatest impact and that we can address, you know, the amount of support that might be coming your way. <laughs> um, and especially, you know, I would like to to ask you, Marina, well, to speak a little bit more to why it's important for us to choose the types of trees and especially to be planting in the equator region. Um, that's that those are where your your projects are and yeah. we've come to understand that yes every tree matters but on a large impact scale those are the areas where we need to make the most um, contribution it's a good question Boni, because everybody asks us that why are you guys not planting in california where we need more trees and they burn and we would need trees in california actually we would need it on the coast so that the moisture from the ocean would be able to would come back over California because we need water in California. So not saying we don't need any there, but uh, you heard me about the poverty alleviation and that, and we feel as well a moral responsibility to give back to the countries that have a much uh, more difficult situation than we have here in the North. So that is for us the new development aid like plant trees in the south is a way to uh, empower the people to have a good living. And so we feel that that's also responsibility and we could uh, tackle the big, uh, you know, immigration issues that we have today, all those refugees. Well, if we had been uh, looking seriously at what's happening in the area of Syria, we know that it started with a big drought uh, that farmers left the, uh, the countryside and went to the cities, then they had no jobs. So this vicious circle starts and then there's conflicts and then you just need a spark for something to happen. And then there's a big crisis and, and now you have the crisis worldwide. So what we want to do with, with our projects is also give back. So that's socioeconomic and we discuss it at length in the activities that we do. There's another uh, important one, which is uh, provided by the scientists who focus on climate. And they have calculated that actually for climate, it'd be better to plant the trees in near the equator than in, for example, Sweden or in, uh, in Alaska or in Canada or in the North uh, for, because of the albedo, because of the reflection of the sun and to make it very super simple, actually, you could say, for example, if you have trees, look at uh, Alaska, for example. If you have trees in Alaska, well, what's the color of your landscape? It's going to be dark green, probably, the color of your trees, like because over there you've got pine trees, right? And well, the dark vegetation attracts heat from the sun. If instead you have no trees in Alaska, but you have snow, big part of the year, then you have white, which reflects the sun heat into space. So just looking at that uh, very specific case, you would say it's better to plant the trees in the south than plant them in Alaska. Just that simple. I'm oversimplifying, obviously, but that's kind of what the message is from the scientists, plant in the south. So fascinating. Um, do you have this type of information and research available to our community that might be interested in knowing a little bit more of yes. the science space? I mean, we could post uh, that information because there's some scientific uh, research and publications on that indeed. The, the part on the albedo, yes. Fantastic. And I, I may this be, might be a little too technical for this discussion, but I'm interested in knowing the difference between, you mentioned enrichment planting approach and the assisted natural regeneration approach as um, kind of techniques that your, uh, yeah. your projects are doing. So can you speak to that just a bit? Yes, <laughs> it's good. You want to learn and you want to be very technical. I love it. Well, <laughs> when you have a project, you got to first look at what makes sense, right? Is there no tree at all anymore? 
then you've got to plant everything and that's framework uh, planting and you say well i'm going to have a nursery and then i'm going to send people out there and then every uh, square meter you plant a tree depending on what's needed depending on the inclination of the soil i mean obviously you do a study and you decide also which species because you could say you start with pioneer trees because it's so dry and it's so tough over there you create pioneer tree or you grow pioneer trees and once they start growing you put fruit trees underneath and then you could remove the pioneer trees so that's kind of the succession planning that we would do in some of the projects in other projects we see for example in the case of india we see that there are some trees remaining right i told you the women see their forest degraded but there's still trees remaining so what do we do well, we would do enrichment planting. We say we go and do an audit and say, well, actually there used to be this and this species and this is gone because maybe they had a lot of value, people cut it or because they died because of a sickness of who knows. And so you say, well, you want to restore, as Tom said before, the, the way it was because that's, that's what is best for nature and for people. So then you do enrichment planting. I mean, selectively uh, grow in a nursery some species which you uh, grow after collecting seeds that you have to look for because so it's not like readily available. You create that, right? So it's a whole, it's a lot of work. And then you selectively uh, plant those trees. The other one is, could be assisted natural regeneration, as you mentioned, which is if an area is threatened by goats and animals grazing, you would protect it and to some extent, you don't need to do much more. You've got to protect it, fence it maybe, or talking to the villagers so that the goats are kept somewhere else. So you need to motivate and, and do something about that. And then the trees will grow again by themselves because unlike in our countries in the north, over there you plant a seed or you just let nature take over and it just happens because it's amazing how heat and uh, some moisture can do miracles, right? Because the seeds are in the soil. So those are the different techniques. Just keep it very, very simple that we use uh, to uh, restore our areas. There is not one recipe for all. Mm -hmm. That That's a very important point, I think. And, and it's something that um, we hope to be able to speak with the community about even more as well, because each area is very, specific and there are different species and there are different issues that each um, region is facing. And so while we can all be contributing to a general reef forest project and you know, located in, in India or Brazil or any of these other areas, we're focusing mainly on India as our group, but each community and each region has its own um, specific set of circumstances that can be addressed and that um, communities can begin to be active in. So with that, I, I, I do want to speak a little bit to our um, initiative, which will be launching this next month. Um, just before we go into that, though, what is the We Forest target now? What is the goal that, that we are looking at in short and long term? Well, in for last year we did a five-year plan so now there's four years to go and we are saying we want to plant uh, 25 million trees we want to have restored 25,000 hectares sorry i didn't translate it into acres it'd be like to <laughs> uh, 50 60 thousand acres or something and we want let me just look at the numbers, but we want to impact an area of 250,000 hectares. So 10 times the size of what we are directly restoring. Let me explain a little bit. So obviously it's all around 25, and so it's easy to remember 25 million trees. We are already now at 17 million trees. And so we will be a little doubling or almost in the next four years. And then the areas we restore is can be uh, identified with GPS points and you can have that on a map, which are the 25,000 hectares. And then when we say we're going to impact a landscape, an area of 250,000 hectares is because what we do is much more than just restore an area. As you've understood from what I explained, we're transforming entire regions because of people around, all the villages around get involved, get a job, you see. 
uh, that's what the, that's the landscape transformation we're doing and that's the measurement that we are targeting and that's the objective we're targeting in the next four years it's quite ambitious it's doubling what we've done so far but it's actually thanks to organizations like you guys uh, wanting to contribute and it's really moving and it's starting to happen so we're very encouraged Amazing. I love the fact that what you've done with metrics is not only look at the specific tree planting impact, but also in the larger kind of multiplier effect. And that is something that we're really considering within, and within our community as well. It's so important to see how that kind of repercussions happen. And sometimes those are not necessarily calculated, but they're oftentimes the most, um, you know, the, the greatest impact that can happen. So um, I, I'm very excited to hear that you've, you've taken that into consideration and, and we should as well. Um, I think at this point in time, Megan, maybe we should talk a little bit more specifically about what our vision is for GSN, um, our membership, and how we can communicate to this, uh, communicate, uh, contribute to this overall um, uh, you know, goal. I think it's very important. You mentioned, Marie Noel, that maybe it was a little ambitious. I think we absolutely have to be ambitious right now. We have to be audacious in our approach to what we're doing. And not only, you know, in, in, in looking at what each individual can contribute, but really having this kind of unifying impact. And if that's one thing, one of the goals that we have for this action initiative this year, it's really being able to make a statement about how a spa industry or a spa and wellness industry can um, make a measurable change and you know for positive climate impact and so um, we'll start little by little but the goal is audacious and it is something that we think is absolutely achievable so um, the 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 decision was made on our board of directors and our membership this year at our green spa network congress that we just had last month in carmel valley california um, we decided to undertake this mission of uh, activating our community towards planting trees with wheat forest. And I should say also there's other um, organizations that are involved that our companies, that our members and sponsor companies have already signed up with. And those are all very noble and um, worthwhile causes. So the idea of us partnering with We Forest doesn't diminish the work that some other organizations are doing and it all counts under our GSN initiative. So um, there are three levels that we're encouraging our community to become involved through. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more deeply about that also on a call that we're having, another Zoom call like this one, which we'll have on May 16th. So Megan will be sending out that information to all the members so that we can speak a little more specifically about how each spa, each um, product company or supplier or therapist uh, at any level can become involved. Um, the ideal scenario is that I should mention that the trees that are planted in India, you've given us the understanding that the cost per tree is a dollar. So basically one dollar, one tree. And so if we think, for instance, as a strategy in a spa, if we have a, um, a massage or a purchase uh, product, and we say $1 of that is going towards the purchase of one tree, that could be the equivalent. And that's pretty much what we're, what we're promoting here. A dollar, a tree, a product, a, a tree, a treatment, a tree, um, anything like that. There are other levels that we can also scale it to. So those specifics will come back to as well. The other idea is to directly engage the, um, the spa guests or the clients of each of these um, companies where we can say, you know, would you like to donate to this tree planting initiative? And there could be a point of sale um, approach there, or there could be a percentage coming out of the spa or the company um, to directly donate on a monthly or you know, quarterly basis or something like that. You have facilitated this setup for us so that the spas can um, work through GSN, but then the contributions are made directly into We Forest for your operations and initiative. And then the other is to encourage each of our members and our our contributing spas and participating wellness professionals to become active in their communities. And whether it's through a school or a local, um, you know, uh, 
uh, a business club or anything where there can be some specific activities happening and all of those feed back into our, our goal and our, um, our initiative as well. So uh, those are very three very specific ways. As I said, more information is coming forward, but we're, we're literally launching, launching officially on May 25th. And um, so we're just excited to have everyone, our goal is all of our members and beyond to participate. And if, if, if a spa or a company is not a member of GSN now by signing up for this initiative and this uh, pledging to plant trees, they will become a member of GSN. Um, Megan, would you like to say some more about all of this? Yeah, well, you said, I said most of it, but I think I want to just mention that we're trying to really mobilize our community to plant one million trees by, by next Earth Day. So I think that's something we can all do if we all work together and, and push forward to this urgent need. Absolutely. And I know that we have quite a few members of our community on our Facebook Live uh, watching and commenting right now. If there's any particular questions that anybody would like to ask, I would say uh, now could be the time to do it. Meg and I are both reading in um, the questions that are coming through. Um, and I, I would love to, to hear back a little bit about that. Um, for you, Marie Noel, I know we've spoken about some of the logistics with this, uh, with this initiative. Is there anything that I haven't mentioned that you would like to mention? I think uh, it was very clear that we will provide you with all the content you need because it's very important to communicate back to your own customers. If you say you plant a tree with them or for them, actually, then you want to make sure that eventually when they come back, you are able to tell them or to show on your website what's happening. We have other organizations that do the same plant a tree for every product. And they're doing an amazing job at communicating, which pays back, actually. So it's also good business because everybody loves trees. Ask around you. You'll see everybody loves trees. And so make sure people see it and it's everywhere because you will benefit. Your business will benefit as well. Absolutely. I think there are a few takeaways that we should um, just mention specifically from this. We'd like to be able to provide um, spa directors or the spa, you know, supervisors and managers the right talking points to be able to talk with their teams so that the entire team at the, um, the spa or within the company is on board. So if anybody has specific questions about that, please do reach out to us. I also want to refer you over to the WeForest website because there's plenty of information there as well. So weforest.org. Um, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be pulling out a lot of information and continually posting also on our, our social media and our website about the, um, the science behind it and also some specific information about the projects that we're undergoing. Eventually there will be a tree counter from all the participating um, members and spas so we can see how many trees are actually being planted. Uh, but we do feel it's very, very important that everybody has the talking points and they feel comfortable in being able to be advocates for this type of movement. I also want to say there's a whole bunch of creative ways that we can be um, sharing this information with our, our spas, our, our clients, our guests. And, um, you know, kids are oftentimes one of the most enthusiastic means to promote these types of activities. So I know, for instance, my nine-year-old is super excited that we're doing this. And she's already been out collecting seeds and planting trees. And she's given me all the books that she has that talk about tree planting. So I want to do a little plug here. Go out and find some really great children's stories. Have them at your spa. Have them in the retail area. They're so inspiring. They're really fun. So um, Barefoot Books is a great resource for that as well. And then there's also quite a lot of um, information out there about community projects and different, as we mentioned before, women's groups that are doing some of this great work um, in the environment. Uh, one I would like to mention is Tree Sisters. That's a, a site that you can visit. And Tom, you might have a, a few more also that um, we would uh, love to mention. I don't know if you have anything offhand. Um, I, you mentioned Tree Sisters. I, I've been working with Tree Sisters now for almost a year on a on a reforestation project, and We Forest is is one of the recipients of the funds that Tree Tree Sisters collects 
Um, they've got an, a goal of, of planting a billion trees and um, have been doing some very good work. And I'm, I was pleased to be introduced to them um, because of my support of WeForest. So we allow, we, awesome. we allow men as well. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say the comments are saying the time is now. So glad this is happening. So excited. <laughs> We're excited. Good to be here. Absolutely. I'll give a little shout out to also to um, Michael Stusser, who is our founding board member, is also mentioning um, Tree Nation and Aaron Abelman. Aaron Abelman is this fantastic, talented young gentleman who's working with um, tree planting and inspiring kids. And he does a great rap um rap music and things it's all around the importance of trees so please check out on our um green green spine network facebook the video of aaron at our congress but also we'll be collaborating with him in his work that he's doing as a uh, promotion for this um this great initiative and uh collaborating also with tree nation which is another great organization so all of that type of information and anybody who's really out there is kind of a a hero, a tree hero, tree hugger hero <laughs> or something, um, send that back in. Let us know what's happening. Let us know who the um, inspiration is out there in the community, who's taking a you know stand, who's really making a difference. Those are the types of things that we want to be kind of a clearinghouse for uh, all that information and, and, and help to celebrate it. So I'll go back to you know one of the things I said in the very beginning. It's about a celebration and we really do want to celebrate this Earth Day and celebrate the connections that we have in our in our spa work and um and bring that out even in a in a wider um and more effective arena so um yeah so this is very very exciting i don't see any more questions coming through um i think we're almost at the top of the hour so that's probably all we have for you today and i'm very excited to see everybody back here on may 16th to talk about the actual launching of the initiative. Okay, great. Tom, Marie Noel, thank you so much. Thank you for being here and sharing your time and your knowledge and for really truly all the great work you're doing. Thanks for bringing us along on this journey. And we'll, we'll be very great to celebrate next Earth Day when we see how many trees have been planted. We will way surpass this 1 million. That's wonderful. We're starting to count. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone great okay well, bye you.